a pioneer of YouTube brand marketing and talent management, could you give some insight into the beginnings of your entrepreneurial success? Yeah, sure. Um, it's a while ago now. I started uh, OP Talent, which is our uh, management agency, about nine years ago now. Um, prior to that, I used to work for a big German uh, media company called Bertelsmann. They obviously they owned Sony BMG Music and different uh, big media properties. And I used to work in the physical side of media back then. And uh, this is where it all came about. I used to be sales director of a division which did manufacturing. Germans are obviously very well known for their, their great manufacturing. And our business was with... Um, in the gaming industry, actually. In fact, the, the, the work we did was printing and pressing optical media, i.e. CDs, DVDs, <clears throat> Blu-ray discs, you name it. Um, and it was for the big, uh, big games publishers. I was the sales director of the gaming side of things. Um, and so <clears throat> I would use YouTube as a resource just to see which games were coming out from all the big publishers, Sony, Microsoft, Activision, EA, or whatever. So I could pitch and make sure that our factories were full making those physical copies of those games from the print, the packaging, distribution, to anything you bought in the shops from Amazon or whatever. And uh, one of our contracts was with Microsoft. We made most of the world's Xbox games. Um, and so I needed to make sure that people who were making games on that platform were, were, were making them through us. So I would use YouTube as a resource for that. But also I had kids back then as well. Uh, I had a couple of, I had, uh, one young one and a little baby on the way. And I wouldn't go out on a Friday night anymore <laughs> um, and we used to uh, stay in on a Friday night myself and some of the other young dads in the, the so-called NCT groups um, and we would babysit while the mums went out for dinner or whatever on a Friday night and we would stay in and play video games online um, one particular game was Call of Duty and we would we would play against each other and I would watch YouTube for the re other reason was to get better at that game <laughs> so I could beat these dads on a Friday night <laughs> So I saw YouTube and the rise of it. And what I found myself doing is just going for tips and tricks and get the latest news on the game we were playing that Friday night. <clears throat> when I went on, I was always finding and coming across the same sort of YouTube channels, the same individuals and creators, rather than sort of traditional gaming journalist reviews. It was actual personalities playing the game and in a much more engaging way than just reading, you know, a magazine of how to get better or, you know, a review step by step. It was, it was a lot, lot more fun. So I found myself going back to these same couple of guys <clears throat> for my tips and tricks uh, so that year um, uh, 2012 I went to a convention um, in LA called E3 it's a big gaming convention the biggest in the world um, and I actually bumped into my first YouTuber it happened to be one of the guys I watched the videos of um, to get better at the game to beat the, beat the young dads and he was there he stood out like a sore thumb on one of the um, one of the stages he was uh, there to see the Call of Duty game early but he wasn't considered industry he wasn't considered a journalist or, or uh, able to actually go go to the convention because um, at the time, you know, a YouTuber was just someone who made videos from home and wasn't considered anything else. So uh, I went up to him because I recognised he was wearing a, a t-shirt, ripped jeans amongst everybody in their suit. So he stood out quite like a sore thumb. And I introduced myself and I, I noticed he had a fake name badge. Um, and I said to him, "Oh, sorry, I thought you were." Uh, X Jaws, the, the 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 YouTube guy. I, I watch your videos. Uh, he goes, "Oh, I am. I, be, be quiet. I, they wouldn't let me in without this pass." So he managed to get in. <clears throat> I mean, lo and you know, move on a couple of years, and people like him are actually a running those shows, hosting them, and promoting them now um, for big sums of money. So how it moved from not being allowed in or considered industry was was quite remarkable, really. <clears throat> so uh, we we got into a chat and. Um, um, he started asking me about the gaming industry and bits and pieces around it because all he knew was video uh, and I knew the gaming industry pretty well. And we got chatting and he said, oh, would you mind if we swap Skype details? I'd, I'd love to ask you a few questions for some of my sort of content. I just thought he was being polite, but we swapped the details. And as I held up my phone, uh, he saw I had an iPhone case on the back, which he liked the look of, which was a Call of Duty iPhone case, which I'd just been given in a meeting as it happened. Just a, it's worth one dollar. It was just a, a giveaway for the show. He says, oh, how do you get one of those? And I said, well, I've got a spare one if you want it. And I gave him the spare iPhone case. Um, and he said, oh, thanks very much. What's your Twitter? I said, I, I know I have one, but I don't use Twitter. <laughs> this is, you know, really early days for me. Um, I think I had one follower who was my wife. And anyway, I had the app, so I opened it. I said, oh, here it is. Here's my handle. He said, thanks. Great. And he tagged me a thank you with a photo of the phone, uh, the phone case. Um, hashtag E3 2012. 
And I gained nearly a thousand followers off that one tweet within like two days. And it was just ridiculous. And I, I learned then how to turn notifications off your phone as well, because it was it was ridiculous. Um, so I saw that sort of influence and it was all these Call of Duty gaming community fans who were his fans asking questions like, well, what's E3? How did you get to see the game early? Um, how do I get one of these iPhone cases? Because it's a real collectible. It was all a bit, a bit alien to me. Anyway, I didn't think anything of it. He walked off and uh, he, had, he had a meeting. Uh, it wasn't with any of the big exhibitors there. It was just with a guy who looked a little bit shady in the corner of the room with a rucksack. I remember his face uh, you know, very well, vividly. And um, it turns out that he did a video for a brand new product while there at E3 with this guy, which was kept in his rucksack because I saw his channel the next week. Um, and the channel was him doing a vlog of E3. So I thought, oh, I'll have a look, see what he got up to while he was there. He got up to absolutely nothing. He couldn't get in anywhere. He wasn't doing anything. The, the video was of him in a, in a stairwell at the convention center with a table um, reviewing a brand new gaming controller product. Now, this is what this, this guy had given him, a brand new sort of prototype of this product. And he did a review video, an unboxing, as you'd call it now, on his channel back in 2012, reviewing this brand new product. This product blew up overnight because it, it had some functionality on it to help you with your reaction time in gaming. <clears throat> So I was interested in two reasons. One, oh, maybe I should get one of these controllers so I can beat the dads on the Friday night. Um, um, it was like there was a, a, a new product version in the market. And everybody who was anybody who played that game wanted one of these controllers because it might give them an advantage. <clears throat> anyway, he said, thanks for good for meeting you. Uh, he, he said, uh, he, he Skyped me actually the, the, that week as well. I said, oh, lovely to meet you. Stay in touch. I thought, well, brilliant. Thanks so much. Thanks for the followers on Twitter. I said, oh, by the way, um, how do I get one of those controllers? Because I'd love to try one out. And he introduced me to the, the only employee, the founder of that company, who kindly sent me one. And while I was talking to him, uh, I realized this video had blown up to about a million views and um, the, the company was getting it was traction everywhere. And I said to the owner of the company, I said, if you don't mind me asking, did you, did you pay Sam, that was his name, the YouTuber, to, to do that video? He said, oh, no, but we let him keep the controller. I said, oh, <laughs> that's... That's great, great deal for you guys. And we started speaking about, well, maybe you should incentivize them to actually keep using it, keep you know, promoting it and uh, you know, sharing links in video descriptions and, and, and on Twitter um, to see if you can, he can help build you again. He said, that'd be a great idea. So we worked out sort of an ambassadorship deal for him. <laughs> I was like, I didn't even work for him. I wasn't his manager. Uh, all I wanted was a free controller at the time. It was just that just these thoughts came up. So I saw that opportunity there and we used that as a bit of, I used that as a bit of a, um, uh, a case study just to myself, um, showing a few other companies we knew in the industry as to this, there's something going on here. There's something here on YouTube where there's an actual audience where people are, are, are vested into an individual enough to A, buy a product or be very influenced by what they're doing um, over just traditional media. Uh, and so that's where those sort of things started. I also then, uh, the following month, there was a, a convention in, in Germany called Gamescom, um, which we exhibited at. and. Because of all my new Call of Duty Twitter followers, um, everyone was asking how to then, what happens at this, this convention? Are we able to go and see this game early and play? And one of the guys who uh, tweeted about this and had followed me from that free iPhone case uh, tweet was a guy called Ali A. He's still one of the biggest YouTubers in the world, biggest gamers. Um, he ended up being our first client as well. Um, and he, he actually said, well, how do I get to this, this event and get in the game? Well, we exhibited there. So I just replied to him privately and said, well, you can have a VIP ticket and I'll get you front of queue passes and by all means, just, just hop over. And he said, you know what, I think I will. And I met him off the plane and we, we hung out a little bit and played, played some games in between meetings. And by the end of the week, I've been walking around and bumping into loads of people I knew and, and introduced him to. Um, he looked at me and he saw the opportunity himself. He looked, he said, you know what, I need an agent. There's such opportunity in this business. And the penny just dropped for me that I was in the middle of this physical digital shift to YouTube, A, for personal use, but B, um, <clears throat> because I was interested in the gaming side as well, plus seeing these YouTube personalities, but also knowing pretty much every tech and digital um, peripheral brand in the industry, I thought, you know what, I could actually just make a few calls here and see if there is actually something here. And that's really where it began. Having managed some of the biggest influencers of today, why do you believe these individuals are so popular and how can businesses translate such methods or techniques to their own success strategy? 
Well, it comes down again to engagement and um, the organic nature of the content and how they how they engage with their, their, their followers. They're far more um, readily available in the eyes of their fans than somebody they have to wait to watch a football match on a Saturday or wait for a TV show scheduled to actually be able to see them. YouTube never goes anywhere. Social media never goes anywhere. It's always on. Uh, and they're there and available and accessible even if it's just um, through the content they're putting out there. And I think this, this engagement of popularity was highlighted best um, in 2015. That's, that's you know, five, nearly six years ago now, and obviously it's coming even further since then. But in 2015, Variety Entertainment, the big US um, entertainment magazine and outlet, uh, did a survey. Every year they do, they, I don't know if they do it anymore, but back then, every year they do a survey from six, for, of 16 to 18 year olds. And it was a survey into influence, but it was, it was based on popularity of, um, of celebrities. So they would include the top sports stars, the top musicians, uh, A-list actors, Hollywood actors. And they would put all these uh, entities together and they would ask these, these, uh, these, these young people who they like the most, who they'd want to meet, how approachable they feel they'd be, how authentic they feel they are. And it was really a, a, a metric into popularity and actually who of these um, actors and celebrities actually are really liked and would want to be met by um, fans. And, uh, and, and really it was, it was a scale, it was called a, they, gave, they were given a Q score and it was out of a hundred. And they, for the very first year in 2015, they included 20 YouTubers in the mix amongst all the rest of the stars. And then they did a top 10. And lo and behold, top four of the top five were YouTubers. So I think the key is the creators have their own platform and this is what brands need too there's no uh, there's no well, there's value but not as much value in having to uh, advertise on tv or or, a, or a advertising board hoarding at a football match anymore building your own platform in the same way as the youtubers have done uh, is key I mean, we work with a lot of brands who are building their own youtube channels making their own content on there yes it involves different youtubers to um, come to the platform and drive an audience there around their their product which is a good fit but ultimately, without that engagement of fans on their own platforms, which is in their hands to create and, and put on social media and on YouTube as they want to, rather than waiting for the, the advertised TV slot or the, the ad board going up in, in three months time on the side of a, a Westfield building, it's very key that they build their own platforms too. And that's where the organic nature of the YouTubers really crosses over to, to how modern day uh, marketing really uh, has its best results. Why why is it important companies keep up with the latest trends in technology and utilize um, modern day mainstream platforms? I mean, you've already touched on it, but if you could expand. Yeah, that. Um, well, it's where their potential audience and customer base, uh, customer base is looking. Um, that's where they're at. That's where they need to be. Um, their competitors will be. If they're not, then they've got a huge disadvantage. Um, one particular case study which comes to mind again um, in this space is a very well-known automotive company, uh, I'll, I'll say the name, Porsche. A few years ago, we worked with Porsche to launch one of their cars, the Porsche Cayman. And <clears throat> instead of it being a TV campaign or an ad-driven thing, they worked with us in Google to create a YouTube video instead. And it was, it was a great video. And the one thing it was lacking though, was a YouTube personality to harness the YouTube audience. Otherwise it wouldn't have got as many organic views. So we worked with them when we placed Ali A, uh, the, the gamer and uh, great entertainer and presenter um, as, as the, the face of the, the advert. So he was raced around in a Porsche Cayman by a pro driver, avoiding drones around this really great Docklands area. And they created a really fun YouTube video in the sort of style of the gamification of Ali A, but also with the cool of the car and the speed of the drone. And it created this wonderful video, which went on Ali A's channel as well as the Porsche channel. <clears throat> and it did millions and millions of views, way more than it would have done if he hadn't been on it or on his channel. And it really just aspired to a generation. A lot of people in the, co in the comments said, <clears throat> why is a YouTuber, a young YouTuber promoting a, a brand which most of his fans probably can't afford right now? Well, that was a really good point. Um, but the main point was I remember being young and I remember having posters on my walls of cars like Porsches and Ferraris and Lamborghinis. Young people have an aspiration. At one point, there will be a point in their, their lives, maybe one in a hundred of them, but out of several million, that's still quite a lot of potential future as well as current 
uh, purchases of the brand to associate with them now instills that throughout their lives and I still remember the the, the first Porsche poster I had a, you know as a probably a, a 10 year old boy on my wall and I still today whenever I see it I think oh that was that Porsche that, that would have been amazing um, obviously times move on and you prefer a different Porsche but the point is it kept Porsche as a cool brand in my mind and it always has so that's the value of it it's future proofing and they showed the, the sheer engagement on the video um, the watch time um, the the click-throughs to the website to, to make their own mock-up of the car <clears throat> was about 20 times more than the previous year's campaign as a TV ad. 